യോഗ നടപടികൾ ആരംഭിക്കുന്നു ബഹുമാന്യനായ വൈസ് ചാൻസലർ പ്രോ വൈസ് ചാൻസലർ രജിസ്ട്രാർ കൺട്രോളർ ഓഫ് എക്സാമിനേഷൻസ് ഡീൻ അക്കാഡമിക് ഡീൻ റിസർച്ച് ഡീൻ സ്റ്റുഡന്റ് അഫയേഴ്സ് എന്നിവരെ വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കും Good morning to all. A very warm welcome to all of you on this pleasant December morning. As you know, the university is celebrating its 12th foundation day today. Ever since we celebrated the first decennium in 2019 it has also been decided to hold the KUHS oration as an annual event the Kerala University of Health Sciences was established on the 7th of December 2009 by enacting an ordinance by the government of Kerala followed by the Kerala University of Health Sciences Act 2010 the state legislature had passed the KUHS Act in the month of january and the then governor sri rs gavai put his signature on it on 22nd january 2010 finally the government of kerala enacted the kuhs ordinance on january 24 2011 all these formalities paved the way for the establishment of the university in the state solely for imparting medical education which has hitherto scattered among the four other universities of the state the kerala university the mahatma gandhi university university of calicut and kannur university the formation of kuhs resulted in shifting all the colleges affiliated to the above universities to the new university today the kuhs is the sole university which can affiliate medical institutions in the state with the jurisdiction spread all over the state of kerala Presently we are proud to announce that the number of affiliated institutions under this university stands 320 so these colleges around 81400 students are studying the university offers around 153 courses in the face of covid-19 the university was the forefront of fight against the pandemic by putting the covid barriers in the disposal of the state government strictly following all the restrictions imported in the wake of nation wide lockdown we were able to conduct examinations for the various courses and publishing the results in a time bound manner true to the word given to the government of kerala we provided the service of the qualified medical professionals to the government in its fight against the pandemic generally universities are expected to take up the course of research activities into its prime responsibilities the school of public health of the university at tiruvananthapuram is in the forefront of such research activities it conducts a regular mphil in epidemiology there and periodically holds various types of seminars symposia on a regular basis thank you and have a nice day respecting our rich tradition and system let's start the function with kvs anthem ിരിനാളം തിരിനാളം തിരിനാളം 
session welcome address we invite professor cp vijayan pro vice chancellor of kuh to extend a warm vote of welcome namaskaram kerala university of health sciences inde 12th sthapaka dinam aagoshikkina velayil adhyakshatha vahikkina samaradhanaya യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി വൈസ് ചാൻസലർ പ്രൊഫസർ മോഹൻ കുന്നമ്മൽ സർവാദരണീയനായ പത്മവിഭൂഷൺ എം എസ് വല്ലിഫാൻ സർ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലെ സഹപ്രവർത്തകരും സ്റ്റാറ്റ്യൂട്ടറി ഓഫീസേഴ്സുമായിട്ടുള്ള രജിസ്ട്രാർ പ്രൊഫസർ മനോജ് കുമാർ കൺട്രോളർ ഓഫ് എക്സാമിനേഷൻസ് പ്രൊഫസർ അനിൽകുമാർ റിസർച്ച് ഡി പ്രൊഫസർ കെ എസ് ഷാജി വിദ്യാർത്ഥികാര്യ ഡീൻ ശ്രീ ഡോക്ടർ ഇക്ബാൽ അക്കാഡമി ഡീൻ ഡോക്ടർ വിനോജ് ഫിനാൻസ് ഓഫീസർ ശ്രീ രാജേഷ് ഇന്നത്തെ പ്രസീജിയസ് അവാർഡ് ജേതാക്കളായ ഏഴ് സ്ട്രീമിൽ നിന്നുള്ള മികച്ച കേരള കേരള യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി ഓഫ് ഹെൽത്ത് സയൻസിലെ മികച്ച ഏഴ് അധ്യാപകരെ ആ അധ്യാപകരെ വാർത്തെടുക്കുന്ന അതിൽ ചെറുതല്ലാത്ത പങ്ക് വഹിച്ചിട്ടുള്ള ആ അതാത് കലാലയങ്ങളിലെ പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽമാരെ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ അക്കാഡമി കൗൺസിൽ ഗവേണിംഗ് കൗൺസിൽ സെനറ്റ് ബോർഡ് ഓഫ് സ്റ്റഡീസ് ഫാക്കൾട്ടി അംഗങ്ങളെ അധ്യാപകരെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളെ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലെ പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട സഹപ്രവർത്തകരെ പൊതുയിടത്തെ വളരെ സന്തോഷത്തോടുകൂടി നമ്മളിന്ന് നമ്മുടെ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ പന്ത്രണ്ടാമത് സ്ഥാപക ദിനം ആഘോഷിക്കുകയാണ് എല്ലാ വർഷത്തെയും പോലെ നമുക്ക് ഒറേഷനുണ്ട് അതുപോലെ കഴിഞ്ഞ കുറച്ച് വർഷങ്ങളായിട്ട് നമ്മൾ തുടർന്നു പോരുന്ന ബെസ്റ്റ് ടീച്ചർ അവാർഡ് ഡിസ്ട്രിബ്യൂഷൻ ഉണ്ട് ഇതെല്ലാം ഈ സന്ദർഭത്തിന് മാറ്റിക്കൂട്ടുന്നു ഈ വർഷം നമ്മൾ വളരെയധികം അനുഗ്രഹിക്കപ്പെട്ടു വല്യത്താൻ സാറിനെ പോലെ ഒരാളുടെ പ്രഭാഷണം ശ്രമിക്കുന്നതിനുള്ള ഒരു അവസരമാണ് നമ്മുടെ മുമ്പിൽ വന്ന് ചേർന്നിരിക്കുന്നത് കൂടുതൽ ദീർഘിപ്പിക്കാതെ ഞാൻ എന്റെ കർത്തവ്യത്തിലേക്ക് അടക്കട്ടെ നമ്മുടെ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ എല്ലാ പ്രവർത്തനങ്ങൾക്കും 
നേതൃത്വം നൽകുകയും നമ്മളെ ശരിയായ ദിശയിൽ നയിക്കുകയും ചെയ്യുന്ന പ്രിയങ്കരനായ നമ്മുടെ വൈസ് ചാൻസലർ പ്രൊഫസർ മോഹനൻ കുന്നുമൽ സാറിനെ എല്ലാ എല്ലാവരുടെയും അനുവാദത്തോടു കൂടി ഈ ചടങ്ങിന്റെ അധ്യക്ഷ വേദിയിലേക്ക് സസന്തോഷം സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു ഇന്ന് ഇവിടെ ഒറേഷൻ നിർവഹിക്കുന്നത് സാറിനെ പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തേണ്ട ആവശ്യമില്ല കേരളീയ കർത്താക്കളും കേരളത്തിന്റെ അഭിമാനമായ അതുപോലെ കേരളത്തിന്റെ അഭിമാനമായ ശ്രീ ചിത്ര തിരുനാൾ ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ടിന്റെ സ്ഥാപക ഡയറക്ടറായ ലോക പ്രശസ്ത കാഡിയക് സർജനായ തിരുവനന്തപുരം മെഡിക്കൽ കോളേജിലെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥിയായിരുന്ന എം എസ് വല്ലിത്താൻ സാറിനെ ആദരപൂർവം ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു നമ്മുടെ കേരള യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി ഓഫ് ഹെൽത്ത് സയൻസിന്റെ മികച്ച അധ്യാപകർക്കുള്ള അവാർഡ് നേടിയ ഏഴ് മഹാന്മാരായ അധ്യാപകർ ഇവിടെ വന്നിട്ടുണ്ട് ഓരോ സ്ട്രീമിൽ നിന്നും അവരെ അലൈഡ് ഹെൽത്ത് സയൻസിൽ നിന്ന് ഡോക്ടർ എം പ്രദീപ് കുമാർ ആയുർവേദത്തിൽ നിന്ന് ആയുർവേദ സിദ്ധ ആൻഡ് യുനാനി ഫാക്കൽറ്റിയിൽ നിന്ന് പ്രൊഫസർ പി വൈ അൻസാരി ഡെന്റൽ ഫാക്കൽറ്റിയിൽ നിന്ന് ഡോക്ടർ ആർ രതി ഹോമിയോപതിയിലെ ഡോക്ടർ രജിത കെ നായർ മെഡിസിൻ ഫാക്കൽറ്റിയിൽ നിന്ന് ഡോക്ടർ പ്രിയ കുമാരി പ്രിയ കുമാരി ചി നഴ്സിംഗ് ഫാക്കൽറ്റിയിൽ നിന്ന് ഡോക്ടർ രോഹിണി ടി ഫാർമസിയിൽ നിന്ന് ഡോക്ടർ ശരത് ചന്ദ്രൻ സി ഈ മികച്ച അധ്യാപകരെ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിക്ക് വേണ്ടി സസന്തോഷം ആദരപൂർവം ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യും ഈ അധ്യാപകർക്ക് മികച്ച രീതിയിൽ പ്രവർത്തിക്കുവാനായിട്ട് അവസരം ഒരുക്കി കൊടുത്ത കൊടുത്ത പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽമാരെയും ആദരിക്കുക എന്നുള്ളത് യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ ഒരു സുചിന്തിതമായ നയമാണ് തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും അവരാണ് ഈ മികച്ച അധ്യാപകർക്ക് പിന്നിൽ പ്രവർത്തിച്ച ശക്തികൾ അവരെ സസന്തോഷം ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യും യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയിലെ എന്റെ പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട സഹപ്രവർത്തകരെ എല്ലാവരെയും ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് നമ്മുടെ സ്റ്റാറ്റ്യൂട്ടറി ഓഫീസേഴ്സും അല്ലാതെയും ഉള്ള എല്ലാ സഹപ്രവർത്തകരെയും സന്തോഷപൂർവ്വം ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുകയാണ് ഇനി നമ്മുടെ ഓൺലൈനിലായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരുപാട് പേരുണ്ട് നമ്മുടെ അക്കാഡമിക് കൗൺസിൽ മെമ്പേഴ്സ് ഉണ്ട് ഗവേണിംഗ് കൗൺസിൽ മെമ്പേഴ്സ് ഉണ്ട് സെനറ്റ് അംഗങ്ങളുണ്ട് ബോർഡ് ഓഫ് സ്റ്റഡീസ് അംഗങ്ങളുണ്ട് ഫാക്കൽറ്റി അംഗങ്ങളുണ്ട് അവരെല്ലാവരും ഇന്ന് ഓൺലൈനിൽ നമ്മുടെ ഈ പരിപാടികൾ ശ്രമിക്കുന്നതിനും കാണുന്നതിനും അതുപോലെ വലിയ തൻസാറിന്റെ ഒറേഷൻ ശ്രമിക്കുന്നതിനും ഒക്കെ ആയിട്ട് ഓൺലൈനിൽ നിലനിൽക്കുന്നുണ്ട് നിൽക്കുന്നുണ്ട് എല്ലാവരെയും സന്തോഷപൂർവ്വം ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു ഇനി ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാം റിപ്പോർട്ട് ചെയ്യുന്നതിനായിട്ട് നമ്മുടെ പ്രസ് അംഗങ്ങളുണ്ട് അവരും പലരും ഓൺലൈനിലായിരിക്കും വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളുണ്ട് യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ കീഴിൽ ഉള്ള മുന്നൂറ്റി പതിനേഴ് മുന്നൂറ്റി ഇരുപതോളം കലാലയങ്ങളിലെ അധ്യാപകരുണ്ട് എല്ലാവരെയും ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി സന്തോഷപൂർവ്വം ഈ ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ട് എന്റെ വാക്കി നിർത്തുന്നു നമസ്കാരം താങ്ക് യു സർ വിത്ത് ഗ്രേറ്റ് ഓണർ ആൻഡ് റെസ്പെക്ട് വി മേ ഇൻവൈറ്റ് ഓണറബിൾ വൈസ് ചാൻസലർ പ്രൊഫസർ മോഹനൻ കുന്നുമൽ ഫോർ ദ പ്രസിഡൻഷ്യൽ അഡ്രസ് ആൻഡ് ഫോർ ഇൻട്രൊഡ്യൂസിംഗ് ദ കെ യു എച്ച് എസ് ഒറേറ്റർ very good morning to you all most respected chief guests and the orator of today's 12th kerala university health science foundation day professor ms valiyathan my esteemed colleagues provost chancellor dr cp vijayan registrar k manoj controller of examination dr anil kumar deans of the university and other respected officials respected principals who are present here and online the faculty members of the affiliated colleges winners of the best teacher award of the university and their family members beloved students ladies and gentlemen today 7th december 
is the foundation day of Kerala University of Health Sciences. The 12th foundation day. 12 years is not a long period in the life of an university. However, in this short period, the university could produce about 1 lakh qualified health professionals who are serving the needy around the globe. The last two years were very tough years for the university. As for other institutions in the world, also due to COVID-19 pandemic. But we face this situation bravely and successfully. When the education system world over was disrupted due to the lockdown and several severe restrictions, we continued our health professional education. The postgraduate courses were never stopped. PG students and interns became COVID warriors. Examinations were conducted promptly and we could provide thousands of qualified doctors, nurses, pharmacists and paramedical staff to the government and society to work in the hospitals and the field to combat COVID-19. Since physical teaching was not permitted initially for the undergraduates, the university switched on to online virtual education. We trained a very large number of our faculty from 320 colleges and made them competent in virtual education. Moodle was identified as the selected platform for virtual education. We opened all our colleges in January 2021 in a graded, guarded manner with special permission from Government of Kerala. Practical and clinical trainings were given to the undergraduate students in the offline physical mode. However, theory classes were continued in the virtual mode. Almost all pending examinations were conducted and results were published within a period of days. Digital valuation was introduced for all postgraduate examinations successfully. Now our aim is to complete digitalization of the theory evaluation process of all our UG and PG theory examinations. All meetings of the university are now conducted virtually and also more frequently. We could interact with the principals of the affiliated colleges on all important matters. The governing council, academic council, the senate met more often during this period on virtual mode. The election process to the second Senate of the university has been completed. We are awaiting the official notification by our honorable chancellor. Last year, our main focus was on research. Already 220 PhD scholars have registered with the university. In this year's PhD entrance examination, 450 students have qualified. These researchers will give a real boost to our research activity. The building for the School of Fundamental Research in Ayurveda was inaugurated at Tripunitra this year. A new MPhil course, Translational Ayurveda, was started in this school. The building for School of Family Health is nearing completion at Kodikod. The Honorable Chancellor released a document on study of family health by the School of Public Health, Tiruvannathapuram. Under the leadership of School of Public Health, several virtual conferences and teaching programs were held mainly focusing on the COVID-19 pandemic. We could inaugurate a solar power plant in this campus, which meets half of the electricity needs of the university. We are planning to increase its capacity and make the university run on 100% solar power that we will be able to achieve within a year. Several new innovative courses were started last year. Number of seats for various courses were also increased. The university is on a verge of huge expansion. We have requested the government to sanction more faculty and ministerial posts. Efforts will be made to enhance research 
in the university by collaboration with other institutions in the state as well as outside. Before I conclude, I must thank our honorable chancellor, respected Sri Arif Muhammad Khan for his timely guidance and support. I thank our pro-chancellor, Srimadhi Vina Jor, the honorable health minister for her valuable advice and support. Our previous vice chancellors, Dr. K. Mohandas and Dr. M. K. C. Nair are our guiding lights. I am extremely happy and proud of our statutory officers and all other staff in the university. Even though our staff strength is much lower than the other universities in the state, because of their commitment and sheer efficiency, the quality and quantity of their work output is much higher. Let me use this occasion to thank each and every one of them. I hope 2022 will be a year of hope and enhanced activity. I wish you all a very happy and COVID-free new year. Now let me come to the very pleasant duty of introducing the 12th Kerala University of Health Sciences Foundation Day Orator, Patma Vibhushan, Professor Dr. Martanda Varma Shangaran Valiathan, popularly known as Professor M.S. Valiathan. By profession, Professor Valiathan is a renowned cardiothoracic surgeon. More than that, he is a great visionary medical leader, proven administrator, accomplished researcher and an institution builder and many, many more. Let me throw the highlights of various aspects of Professor Valiathan. He was born in Maveli Kera in 1937. His parents were Mardanda Varma and Janagi Varma. He had his uh, original uh, school education in Maveli Kera, subsequently the university college and he was a member of the first batch of Trivandrum Medical College, the first batch student of Trivandrum Medical College. It's a historic batch. And then he did his surgery training from Royal College of Surgeons. He had FRCS and then he did subsequent training and he did training in cardiothoracic surgery from John Hopkins University. He worked in, subsequently he worked in Georgetown University, USA, then Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Chandigarh, and also he was a faculty in IIT Madras also. Then from there, the then Chief Minister, Sri C. Achuda Menon, brought him to Kerala, and he founded, and he became the founder, director of the Sri Chitra Tirunal Medical Sciences, and rest is history. And after a long stint in Sri Chitra Tirunal, making it an institution on par with any institution in the world, he moved on to Manipal University where he was the first vice chancellor. And today, the government has declared him as the national research professor of government of India. And now he's, he's engaged in research in various aspects, especially now he's on uh, Ayurveda. If a renaissance is going to happen to Ayurveda, and the only man responsible for that will be Professor Dr. M. S. Valiata. In Sri Jitra, the, we know about the Sri Jitra prosthetic heart valve, the Sri Jitra valve graft, blood bag, oxygenator, all these things are uh, due to Professor Valiathan's sincere efforts. Then he has been a member of various uh, committees, council, UGC, ICMR, and he was the president of Vice Chancellors of India. Then he have, he was given fellowships by various societies, Indian Academy, so, so many societies in India and abroad. And several books have been published. Now his recent focus is on Ayurveda, the, the legacy of Charaga and uh, the legacy of Shusrada, the legacy of Vagbada. These are all the great monumental books published by Professor M. S. Valiathan. And these are the uh, few of the books published by 
Professor Valetan. With this, uh, I, I don't know whether I have been able to introduce him properly. He was he had he, he was given honorary degrees by uh, almost all universities uh, in India and abroad, and several awards have been uh, given to him, uh, like J.C. Bose Medal, Kerala uh, State Science and Technology Award, Dhanundri Award. So many awards have been given to him, and. The government of India uh, honored him by Patma Bhushan and Patma Vibhushan. I don't know, I was able to introduce him properly. So, Professor uh, M.S. Valyatan is in front of us. Sir, I request you to begin your oration. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Mohanan, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Mohanan, senior officials of the University of Health Sciences, members of the faculty of all the colleges, students, and the esteemed academic community of this university. I would like to extend my most cordial thanks for the warm welcome you have given me and for the invitation to give this Foundation Day lecture of this university. I have been out of Kerala for a number of years now, but I do keep in touch of the developments in our state. And it is a matter of uh, great pleasure that Kerala also has a University of Health Sciences, uh, which is a home of not only medicine, but many other disciplines. In other words, it was a belated recognition that health is too big a subject for medicine. There is much more in health. Now this came in the history itself, if you look, Industrial Revolution, all of you have heard, it first came in the 18th century in England, Liverpool, Manchester, especially these two places. Now, when this came, industries producing large quantities of cloth, many other things, jobs were created, and a lot of people from the villages of England started migrating to these cities. Goldsmith, very great poet at that time, some of you may recall, there's a famous poem, The Deserted Village. That's a classic example. People were leaving the villages, going to the cities to make money. Now, these two cities, their municipal services were not well developed. But suddenly, these thousands of people coming in search of jobs. They had no proper housing. There was no proper sanitation. Clean water was not available. And before you knew there was epidemic, especially cholera, gastrointestinal diseases, pneumonia, etc. And this became so bad, the mortality, people dying, dead bodies on the street, municipal services unable to cope with this, and the doctors, medical community was unable to cope with it. There was no germ theory, nobody knew that these diseases were due to bacteria. Doctors were still writing prescriptions without any effect at all. Then some good people, they were not highly educated people, they were not doctors or nurses, and they got together and said, we cannot have these people dying on the street, we must do something. And their whole prescription was a housing, a proper roof over their head nutritious meals twice a day, sanitation, clean water. Let us provide these. Everybody made fun of them, especially the educated people, doctors. They all condemned them. These people know nothing about diseases. And this kind of thing they are doing, they are interfering in areas they have nothing to do with. But they persisted because they were not ordinary people, highly dedicated. Within a year, 
the areas served by these good samaritans their mortality dropped to 20 or 25 or something like that whereas the rest of the industrial part of the city liverpool and manchester that was close to 70 in fact there was a brutalization of the society itself because mothers working in these factories they wanted to work overtime and make money and their children were crying and this became a news and so they would give laudanum a morphine preparation to these kids to keep them quiet this was accepted practice you can imagine how much of dehumanization had happened with this now this recognition lay people who had nothing to do with medicine they were not doctors they were not treating with drugs so here was a extraordinary example a fit epidemic being controlled by non physicians without medications that was the beginning of public health people suddenly realized opened their eyes the chadwick report in england soon followed by beveridge report in the united states they all came out of this public health that was far beyond that is that was one old example there is another interesting example in the 20th century in india when we were medical students also we had a disease called latherism now i asked a medical student the other day he had never heard of it now latherism we had a subject a, a chapter in our medical text and that was there was a particular uh, dal which uh, uh, that dal which was used in uh, i can't remember the name of that dal in madhya pradesh and areas like that and this dal was used for making chapatis what was not known was it had a toxin in it it was recognized even during the british rule that this eating this without cooking if you boiled it this toxin could be removed that was known but still the atta would be made without boiling chapatis are made and people get paralysis para, para paralysis crippled them in fact horses when they were fed horses developed paralysis this was known a lot of research was done medical council at the medical research at that time british days post independence nothing could do there were even attempts by the agriculture people to develop new strains of this dal which would be free from this toxin nothing worked but lo and behold in 1970 or end of 1960s this latherism simply disappeared no latherism cases not that anybody had done anything it was a big puzzle no patients and the reason was not because doctors did anything or medical research produced any great profit access for this what had happened was the green revolution wheat became available wheat was cheap so people simply switched from this dal they switched to wheat and that was the end of latherism there had nothing to do with medicine nothing to do with doctors it had to do with agriculture agricultural economics here again it shows it is our when you talk about health it is far beyond medicine that is an open recognition of this but when we attained freedom in 1947 after 250 years of british rule conditions were not very it was not good old days they were actually very bad days i joined medical college in 1951 that was four years after the independence so i can remember some of these life expectancy was less than 30 at that time infant mortality was over 150 some areas more than 200 some parts of it because there are great disparities in india and epidemics especially cholera smallpox plague these all happen what is called clusters now in those days pockets we could see cholera for example nearly always in bengal it would be there but smallpox plague not all over india but in pockets these things used to happen infectious diseases especially typhoid fever pneumonia and these typhoid fever there was no treatment i was a witness in the medical college i used to see that the fever wards in the general hospital mortality was not less than 30 or 35% patients who came they would die there was no treatment we were doing fever mixture 
serpentines, tube on the abdomen, throat pains. These are all the things we will do. All we know that there is no treatment for type 1 fever. So mortality was very high. Pneumonia was another great killer. Infectious diseases. These were very common. And we had only around 20 or 25 medical colleges, I think, at that time, independence, producing a few hundred doctors. They simply cannot cope with this. Ayurveda was in very bad shape. Gurugulas had perished. There were no Gurugulas, no proper way of training them. So a lot of quackery was being done as Vaidurangam P.S. Warrior himself used to bomb this. A lot of quacks masquerading as Vaidurangam. So Ayurveda was in very bad shape. So India was in a very bad state. That is how the board committee report points out many a case. Compared to those, look at the transformation which has taken place today. We tend to be critical all the time about ourselves. But when we look at what, had, what is available to us, in 1947 and what today, there is a huge contrast. Today, the life expectancy is 65 to 70. Kerala it is exceeding 70. Infant mortality in Kerala has come down to six, as low as the United States. The rest of the country, it is still 30, like Madhya Pradesh. 30 infant mortality, still high. But I think to compare with what we used to have. Epidemics, forget the pandemic. I will not, that is an unprecedented thing. You can't bring it into our present discussion. But infectious diseases, nothing like what we have. We have actually crossed that state. Infectious diseases are no longer the great killers they were. Pneumonia. Very few medical students have seen pneumonia. Low bar pneumonia, which we used to see, dread produced by pneumococcus. We hardly ever see that. If at all it comes, easily treatable. Typhoid fever. We don't always admit those patients. They are sent home with a prescription. They can take medicines at home. So the infectious diseases, the dread is gone. It is no longer the number one threat to health because they have been replaced by more communicable diseases today. We have uh, diabetes, coronary artery disease, cancer, automobile accidents. All these have become the great killers today. So therefore, there is a very big change today in terms of great advances on which we can be really proud. But there are two challenges. There are many challenges, but I would like to uh, concentrate on two in which I have some special interest. And one of them is our excessive dependence on imports, import of equipment and instruments, technology, and import of ideas. These are the two areas which are crippling. It's not often recognized. I would like to illustrate this. If you look at the practice of medicine today, all over India, we have so many hospitals now, district level, we have tertiary hospitals today. And if you look at the hospitals all over, whether at taluk level hospitals, district level hospitals, or teaching hospitals, all of them, they are all heavily dependent on the use of technology. You simply cannot, this is even true for Ayurvedic hospitals, for physiotherapy institutions. They use equipment, they use instruments, all of them, wherever technology is used, what I say will apply. If they are sophisticated equipment, for example, you go to a, a district hospital, the diagnostic, you have auto analysis. If you have a large number of samples, you make analysis, all the biochemical parameters, there is other parameters, you read auto analysis. These are important. Then you want to have various types of electrophysiological ECG, EEG, all those electrophysiological instruments, they are instruments important. If you take imaging instruments, X rays, CT scan. MRI, PT scan, all these things, ultrasound. Without that, medicine is impossible today to practice. All these are important. Now, leaving aside these instruments, you move to another large area of technology, the devices that are disposable of some implants. And a great number of disposable, there are thousands of them. Simple things like a syringe, it's not very simple, but anyway, it is a simple disposable. Too sophisticated, like our oxygenator or a dialyzer used by the nephrologist. 
These are all disposables, used ones and thrown away. They are all important. Prosthetics and dentistry, orthopedics. Many of them are important. And if you take the most sophisticated, called implants, these are wholly 100% important. Like, like face marker, for example, or heart valve, all those you take, cerebral things, shunt, neurosurgeons use. You take all brain stimulated. They're all important. So when you look at this uh, whole range of instruments and devices, prosthetics, India is importing something like 20,000 crores of rupees a year. And out of this, 70% we are importing. Nobody really talks about it very much. It is taken for granted. But the fact is, there is a, a report jointly produced by the Public, Public Health Foundation of India and the CII two years ago. And they have pointed out that these devices and instruments which are important at very high cost, and it keeps on growing at the rate of 12% a year. Now this high cost import, it is only meeting the needs of 20% of the population. Because the rest of them, it is beyond their needs, they can't buy this. So here we are, we are obliged to import these, without which we cannot practice. We do make some of these, but these are the low end technology. For example, a dental chair, a very essential, or an operating room table. Such things we are making in all these. But that is a very low end. The high end equipment, instruments, devices, everything we are doing. Now, how long can we sustain this? 20% they get all this, 80% they get all the total. This goes on and on. And this is only widening this gap. And socially, as you know, this is not acceptable. It is not even sustainable in the long run. Now that is something which we have to understand. And I may even add something here, which I hadn't wanted to say this year, because in the World Trade Organization, India is a signatory. And we have to go by the rules of the World Trade Organization. World Trade Organization, the rules are essentially set up by the rich countries. We must accept them. That's how it is done. Now there, all these uh, medical instruments, etc., we have their intellectual property. It belongs to somebody else, we have to pay for it. But they had, at the time this was made, they had exempted procedures, which was generous action on the part of rich countries. For example, coronary artery bypass. It was a new technology. It is intellectual property. They could say, you pay for this. But they said, no, all these procedures we will accept. So that we can do. We don't have to pay anything to do coronary artery bypass operation or a joint replacement operation. Joint, you have to pay. But that procedure, you don't have to pay. It is freely available to us. But a situation can arise when countries like India, they start doing these procedures here using import of instruments and devices large number of operations are done. And I have seen some literature from the medical community who will make billions of dollars from medical tourism. These are kind of announcements they make. What they don't realize is, this is intellectual property belonging to somebody else. They made this. And we have a, a free ride that has been given by the WHO, by the World Trade Organization. But suppose we use that knowledge freely without paying it, and their patients come here and we operate on them and we make billions of dollars. Do you think it is sustainable? Will they accept it? They are already discussing this. So in a way, we should understand the limitations of this. The triumphant declarations that we can do, make billions of dollars from medical tourism. Uh, that is something which we should think of this also, a possibility that they may not accept it. That is, as far as they, that is the major problem as regards, not this procedure part, I just mentioned it here for your knowledge, so that these dangers can arise. So unless there is a conscious program to develop our own intellectual property, it is not possible to be self-sufficient, we must realize that.
advanced country like Japan, they also import, but they also export. It is an equal relationship. Similarly, India should import whatever is necessary, essential, but we should also produce sophisticated things which will make global standards and export. That is the, what we should aim at, not keep on banning. That is not the solution. The solution is this. We want to have world standards, world standards of safety, of efficacy. We will insist on that. Everybody should have it, not 20%. That particular issue has to be addressed. That is one. Second, this is about import of technology. The second is the import of ideas. That is also, I don't think this often happens. Ideas, take for example, the COVID, the recent uh, disaster is still with us. And at the height of it, during the second wave, for example, many of you would have seen this, the discussions by experts, uh, discussions on experts' views by others. We used to have on trying time so many of these. And many times I have seen the data for all this, how many cases are there, how many people have a particular variant expression. All these data that we have, regions of India, most of the different states, differential incidents, all these data, they are based in India. We produce the data. Health Ministry has all the data. But this data is not secret. It is public immediately. It is transmitted all across the world instantly. But this data is used by foreign universities, very excellent universities in the world, in the United States mainly, some in Britain. They analyze the data and they come out with modeling techniques. It is a mathematical technique. What are the scenarios which can arise? Are young people likely to be affected? Or will there be a second wave, a third wave? All sorts of possibilities. In modeling, that is what they do. Different possibilities, they play with them. And which is most likely, which are most likely, that kind of prediction. Everybody listens to that. Indian exports are also listening. Now, this was going on and on. Now, have you, it occurred to me that we have centers of epidemiology in India. Achyadavanan Center has a center for epidemiology, many others. There is an institute of epidemiology of the government of India in Chennai. All these institutes, they are all silent. I don't see any such analysis coming. There are a few IITs have tried to do this modeling, but they are hardly audible. We only hear about these foreign universities talking about this. Why is it we cannot do this? But this is small ideas. We are short of ideas. This comes again and again. For example, technology assessment, a major area. We say now we companies come and tell you this is second model is far superior to the first model. How do we decide it is superior? Is there some way of measuring that? Now we only go by the, what the agent is telling us. We have no way of assessing. We don't have an engineering system which can subject this to test their claims and say, yes, this is indeed superior to that. We don't have that. Now the technology assessment, which is practiced abroad for several years, and in England, they have actually put it into practice. It's a very good system. National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Now, when this now, how they develop this is all known. This is in public domain. There's nothing to stop us from learning from that and doing it ourselves. Nothing is secret here. No company is taking a profit. But in government of India, a decision was made. We should have technology assessment. And we go on. Now, finally, we signed an agreement with you know, NICE in England so that they get their help to do this. Again, we have ideas. 70 years after independence, ideas were important, but there is no need for it. So these are two areas which uh, concern me. That one is import of technology. I'm not against import, essential must be imported, but we must be exported. Same level of technology. It is no use exporting low level technology, time depressor, thermometers, all these we are importing. A dental chair we are exporting. That is not a thing. We are not equals. It is time that this changed. That is some ideas, especially with all these bright people, the IITs and so on. We all the time we are hearing this. Why is it necessary that all these data produced here, analysis and forecasts are made 
somewhere else. That has to stop. Now, these are big all India issues. I realized that uh, a university like Kerala Health Sciences University cannot address these problems. It is an all India effort. There are several agencies responsible for it. I just wanted you to see the global national picture. What can a university do? That is what we have to look at. There, I would say only three things in general terms. One is, first of all, this university or any university for that matter, the first objective is to produce or nurture, not produce, nurture good Indian citizens, with good character, incorruptible. This is the first objective. Somehow in the UGC and all that, I was part of it when uh, reports are made that this is not considered right. People don't like to say these things for some reason. But the fact is the first job of this university or any university is to nurture good citizens who are incorrect. I won't get into the details of this. That is number one. Number two, this university should produce good professionals, very competent, good professionals, who should be good in theory, good in practice, updated, and who can compare with the best from any institution in India, from all of the institute, or institute of public health, anywhere. There should be a match for those. All of their ranking, how many of them, there are ways of measuring this. So we should produce uh, or nurture excellent professionals in all these areas, Ayurveda, physiotherapy, Unani, whatever subject you take. At all India level, our alumni from here should have a top place. That is the second. And the third, which the universe, and this, if you do it properly, then it is a great contribution to India. Uh, these professionals, many of them, the, the Indian problem will be solved only by 100 health science universities coming. Then you will find we make a dent in that. But after all, it's done by human beings. That is, and the third is, these very great things happen. Sometimes they through a single individual. A C.V. Raman, for example, who died long ago, 1970s. Still, he is an inspiration for us. His Nobel Prize was 1930s. Still, he continues to inspire in terms of uh, research, in terms of uh, design of instruments, everywhere. You will find his continued influence. Now, if we produce people like that, I cannot believe that with C.V. Raman, all this kind of creativity stopped. In India. It's not correct. There must be many such people. But somehow we are failing to detect them and nurture them. I want to give one example, specific example. This is an Egyptian, Ahmed Zuvel. Ahmed Zuvel got a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Our Indian National Science Academy, we gave him an honorary fellowship. So when he came to accept that, he made a speech. It got a great impression on all of us. He said he passed his, he got his PhD in the University of Cairo. And when he got his PhD, he wanted to do a postdoc for two years. So he went to his professor and told him uh, that professor, I want to get a postdoc fellowship here. What do you want to do? So he wanted a chemical reaction. Like if you take sodium chloride and silver nitrate, you drop it, there is a white ring which will form. It's a simple experiment you do in high school. It takes only a few seconds for that ring to form. So it is well told uh, his professor, sir, I want to study that reaction. It's 10 seconds. What happens in the first second or the 100th of the first second? From there, how does it from the atomic level to this ring? I want to study that chemical reaction. So the professor's response was, well, if there was anything in it, somebody would have done it out of it. You don't have to do it. That was the response. And Zuvail told us, I'm sure your Indian professors will say the same. This is what he said. But he continued and he kept on sending applications to the United States. At last, the California Institute of Technology gave him a postdoc fellowship. So he went there. 
and he talked to the, the professor, asked him the same question, what do you want to do? So he repeated all this, perhaps with greater clarity. So that professor's reaction was entirely different. He said, well, it is an interesting idea. Here is a lab, go and do it. That lab was not that well equipped. There was a chemical chemistry laboratory. He suddenly realized he had to find the answer himself. He was responsible. The professor was not asking any further questions. But subsequently what happened, that is the lesson for us. He said the next three, four months, a man who had only worked in chemistry, he was interacting with all sorts of scientists there, mathematicians, physicists, laser instrumentation people. In, and their informal discussions over a cup of tea or lunch or simply sitting under a, in a park and chatting, many of these discussions are on scientific subjects. They're totally absorbed. Now, during these discussions, he found out that a second, just like an hour, you make it into 60 minutes, minutes into seconds. Seconds also can be split, theoretically. You can split it into 10,000 or 100,000. It is feasible. It's a mathematical technique. All this he learned from others. And then he found what happens in this millionth of a second that can be studied using spectroscopy. So that was a new education for him. Cut the long story short, in a matter of uh, six years or so, he found this is called femtochemistry. So femtosecond spectroscopy, that is the technique he developed. So that one millionth of a billionth of a second, that is the time, these are transition states in the chemical reaction. That can be studied, that can be recorded. And that is today, when you do this LASIK surgery, in the eye, when you see that being done, they are actually using this principle. Now, this was the sub six years he got the other course. So he told us, here is an example. He got his PhD, but that nurturing which took place, non-formal education, he was not listening. Lectures also he listened. But what really fertilized his mind was this contact with different types of people over a period of time, unrestricted. And the professor, after three or four months, he went to his professor. The professor never summoned him during this time. He went to him and so, so he asked him, how is the work going? He said, sir, I'm doing okay. I would like to do this kind of spectroscopy. I have got some equipment, but I need ABCD. He said, okay, go ahead and buy that. That's how it is done. Now here, at least I know hundreds of objections will come. Oh, we can't do it. Now, that may be partly true, but don't take this. We should not take that view, it cannot be done here. This is what I heard in a very humble way when we wanted to develop prosthetic heart valve. I heard this hundreds of times. Oh, this cannot be done here. This cannot, it's impossible. We cannot get these small things repaired here. You are talking about heart valve. This is easily said, but it's not true. I think if you work hard, if you have the tenacity, a lot of this can be done. That is, I want to say that. Now, I have talked at length, but I want to say, why is it? There is something elusive, something I'm missing. That is, if you uh, have very good epidemiologists, we have institutions dealing with data. Why is it we are not able to do this kind of modeling, forecasting? Why is it it is not happening? We have to listen to foreigners telling us all this, what to do. What could happen? That is one, there is a problem there. We have a number of institutions for the last 40, 50 years, big institutes, developing instruments, instrumentation departments with professors, PhD students, MSc students, large number of them. There is an institute of instrumentation itself, Central Bank. Very large institutes, at what stop? With all these institutions, industry doing out their own, with all this, how is it that 70% we have to input? Why is it we are not able to translate all this? If there are 100 MTech theses, how is it that even 20 of them don't become products which we are using? Why is it not happening? Now, when I see this repeatedly in every field, I'm not familiar with all, all that happens in India. Only a limited area I'm familiar with. But there I come across this repeatedly. 
There is something lacking. Now that, what is lacking, I want to give a story and stop. And that is the story of Japan. You know, Japan is a country I greatly admire. Their achievements are extraordinary. In the, for two centuries, Japan closed down their country. Some of you may know this. That is, 17th century, there was a recognition in Japan that foreigners are coming and the foreign influence, the religion, culture, they're all changing. So Japan decided they would close down their country. Nobody would come in, nobody would go out. For almost 200 years, they closed down their country. That was the time Commodore Perry of the US Navy came across the Pacific with their gunboats and said, open up, we want to have trade with you. They had to agree because they didn't have the weapons to fight. They opened. But that was a religion, the rude awakening for them. And immediately the response was to send a, a group of young Japanese, fiercely patriotic, to Europe. And one of the leaders of this group was a man called Masan. When they reached, uh, they went to Germany and France. And this Masana was in Paris. And he went there, he found that he was dazzled by Paris. So he wrote letters to his friends saying, this place is incredible. We can never do anything like that. He began to despair in the lectures. But when he was there, two years later, there was a war between Germany and France. And Paris was simply destroyed. So his spirit picked up. He said, oh, what I thought was a fantastic place. It has crumbled to dust. Maybe we can do something better. The tone of his letters changed. And he came back to Japan. And this group, they produced a report about rebuilding of Japan. And in that report, he writes, for developing a country, or building a country, three things are required. One is capital. Second, Lands and regulations. And thirdly, spirit of the people. And if I had to give scores, I would give one for capital. I would give four for plans and regulations. I would give five for spirit of the people. Because capital, plans and regulations, they are all sitting on the table, they don't move. They move only by the spirit of people. I would give five marks. Now this is our problem. Japan, after this report they produced, they started working exactly what this recommendation said. And you know what Japan did in a matter of 50 years. It became like a European country in terms of science and technology. They never gave up their culture. Japanese are fiercely proud of their culture. They still are. But in science and technology, they can compete with any country here, here today. That is the spirit of the people. And this can only be nurtured in places like universities. I can only say, uh, you, you are all teachers, profession, education. I was a surgeon, I was not a teacher in that sense. But you know how to motivate, how to inspire the students and nurture them, the spirit of achievement, spirit, in, spirit of making our country great. I'm sure it can be done, but the greater effort is needed. I will stop with this appeal and thank you all once again for giving me this great privilege. Thank you. Thank you, sir for the inspiring, enlightening talk. We are very much thankful to you. Please give a standing oration to sir. Thank you. Now we will go on to the uh, award giving ceremony to the best teachers of the university.
എല്ലാവരും കാത്തിരുന്ന സുപ്രധാന ചടങ്ങിലേക്ക് ഏവരെയും സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു അലൈഡ് വിഭാഗത്തിന്റെ രണ്ടായിരത്തി ഇരുപത്തിയൊന്നിലെ മികച്ച അധ്യാപകനുള്ള പുരസ്കാര ജേതാവ് ഡോക്ടർ പ്രദീപ് കുമാർ എം ആദരപൂർവം അദ്ദേഹത്തെ വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു തിരുവനന്തപുരം ഗവൺമെന്റ് മെഡിക്കൽ കോളേജിലെ എം എൽ ടി വിഭാഗത്തിൽ അസിസ്റ്റന്റ് പ്രൊഫസറായി പ്രവർത്തിക്കുന്നു ക്ലിനിക്കൽ കെമിസ്ട്രി ബയോടെക്നോളജി മോളിക്കുലാർ ബയോളജി മേഖലകളിൽ ഇരുപത്തിയഞ്ചിൽ പരം വർഷങ്ങളുടെ ഗവേഷണ അധ്യാപന പരിചയമുണ്ട് അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് കേരള ആരോഗ്യശാസ്ത്ര സർവകലാശാലയുടെ സെനറ്റ് അക്കാദമിക് കൗൺസിൽ ബോർഡ് ഓഫ് സ്റ്റഡീസ് എന്നീ കമ്മിറ്റിയിൽ അംഗവുമാണ് തിരുവനന്തപുരം ഗവൺമെന്റ് മെഡിക്കൽ കോളേജിന്റെ പുരസ്കാരം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിനുമായി ഡോക്ടർ പ്രദീപ് കുമാർ സാറിനെ ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു ആയുർവേദ വിഭാഗത്തിലെ മികച്ച അധ്യാപകനുള്ള പുരസ്കാര ജേതാവ് ഡോക്ടർ പി വൈ അൻസാരി അൻസാരി സാറിനെ വേദിയിലേക്ക് ആദരപൂർവം ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു ത്രിപുണിത്തര ഗവൺമെന്റ് ആയുർവേദ കോളേജിലെ ദ്രവ്യഗുണ വിഭാഗം മേധാവിയാണ് ഡോക്ടർ അൻസാരി ഇരുപത്തിയഞ്ചിൽ പരം വർഷങ്ങളുടെ ഗവേഷണ അധ്യാപന പരിചയമുള്ള ഡോക്ടർ അൻസാരി കേരള ആരോഗ്യശാസ്ത്ര സർവകലാശാലയുടെ മുൻ ആയുർവേദ സിദ്ധ യുനാനി ഫാക്കൽറ്റി ഡീനും നിലവിൽ ബോർഡ് ഓഫ് സ്റ്റഡീസ് അംഗവുമാണ് മുപ്പത്തിയഞ്ചിൽ പരം പ്രസിദ്ധീകരണങ്ങളുടെയും നാല് അക്കാദമിക് പുസ്തകങ്ങളുടെയും രചയിതാവുമാണ് തൃപ്പൂണിത്തറ ഗവൺമെന്റ് ആയുർവേദ കോളേജിനുള്ള പുരസ്കാരം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിനായും ഡോക്ടർ അൻസാരി സാറിനെ ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു അടുത്തതായി ഡെന്റൽ വിഭാഗത്തിന്റെ ബെസ്റ്റ് ടീച്ചർ സമ്മാനർഹ ഡോക്ടർ രതി ആർ മേഡത്തിനെ വേദിയിലേക്ക് ആദരപൂർവം ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു രണ്ടായിരത്തി എട്ട് മുതൽ കൊല്ലം അസീസിയ ഡെന്റൽ കോളേജിലെ ഓറൽ പെത്തോളജി ആൻഡ് മൈക്രോബയോളജി ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെന്റിന്റെ മേധാവിയും വൈസ് പ്രിൻസിപ്പളുമായി സേവനം അനുഷ്ഠിച്ചിരുന്നു കേരള സ്റ്റേറ്റ് കൌൺസിൽ ഫോർ സയൻസ് ടെക്നോളജി ആൻഡ് എൻവയോൺമെന്റിന്റെ ധനസഹായത്തിൽ നടത്തുന്ന പ്രോജക്ടിന്റെ പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ ഇൻവെസ്റ്റിഗേറ്ററായും പ്രവർത്തിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് മുപ്പതിൽ പരം ലേഖനങ്ങൾ ദേശീയ അന്തർദേശീയ അംഗീകാരമുള്ള പ്രസിദ്ധീകരണങ്ങൾ എഴുതിയിട്ടുണ്ട് അസീസിയ ഡെന്റൽ കോളേജിന് വേണ്ടി പുരസ്കാരം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിനും ഡോക്ടർ രതി ആർ മേഡത്തിനെ ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു ഹോമിയോ വിഭാഗത്തിൽ മികച്ച അധ്യാപകയ്ക്കുള്ള പുരസ്കാര ജേതാവ് ഡോക്ടർ രജിത കെ നായർ രജിത മേഡത്തിനെ വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു തിരുവനന്തപുരം ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഹോമിയോപതി കോളേജിലെ റെപ്പറ്ററി വിഭാഗത്തിൽ പ്രൊഫസറായി സേവനം അനുഷ്ഠിക്കുന്നു നാഷണൽ ആയുഷ് മിഷന്റെ സോറിയാസിസ് റിസർച്ച് പ്രൊജക്ടിൽ പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ ഇൻവെസ്റ്റിഗേറ്ററായും പ്രവർത്തിച്ചു വരുന്നു മുപ്പതിൽ പരം ലേഖനങ്ങൾ ദേശീയ അന്തർദേശീയ അംഗീകാരമുള്ള ജേർണലുകളിൽ പ്രസിദ്ധീകരിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് തിരുവനന്തപുരം ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഹോമിയോപതി കോളേജിന് വേണ്ടി പുരസ്കാരം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിന് രജിത മേഡത്തിനെ വീണ്ടും ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു അടുത്തതായി മെഡിസിൻ വിഭാഗത്തിന്റെ ബെസ്റ്റ് ടീച്ചർ സമ്മാനാർഹ ഡോക്ടർ പ്രിയ കുമാരി ടി മേഡത്തിനെ ആദരപൂർവ്വം വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു തിരുവനന്തപുരം റീജിയണൽ ക്യാൻസർ സെന്ററിലെ പീഡിയാട്രിക് ഓങ്കോളജി വിഭാഗം മേധാവിയാണ് ഡോക്ടർ പ്രിയ കുമാരി ഇരുപത്തിയഞ്ച് വർഷത്തില് പരം അധ്യാപകന ഗവേഷണ പരിചയ സമ്പത്തിനുടമയായ ഡോക്ടർ നാൽപ്പതിൽ പരം ദേശീയ അന്തർദേശീയ ജേണലുകൾ ലേഖനങ്ങൾ എന്നിവ പ്രസിദ്ധീകരിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് നാഷണൽ പീഡിയാട്രിക് ഹെമറ്റോളജി ഓങ
രണ്ടായിരത്തി പത്ത് രണ്ടായിരത്തി പതിനൊന്ന് വർഷത്തെ ബെസ്റ്റ് സയന്റിഫിക് പേപ്പർ അവാർഡും ലഭിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് ആർ സി സിക്ക് വേണ്ടി അവാർഡ് ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിനുമായും പ്രിയാകുമാരി മേഡത്തിനെ ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു നഴ്സിംഗ് വിഭാഗത്തിൽ മികച്ച അധ്യാപികയ്ക്കുള്ള പുരസ്കാര ജേതാവ് ഡോക്ടർ രോഹിണി ടി ഡോക്ടർ രോഹിണി ടി കിഴക്കമ്പലം പഴങ്ങനാട് സമരിറ്റൻ കോളേജ് ഓഫ് നഴ്സിംഗിലെ അധ്യാപികയാണ് മെഡിക്കൽ സർജിക്കൽ നഴ്സിംഗ് വിഭാഗത്തിൽ പതിനെട്ട് വർഷത്തെ അക്കാദമിക് പരിചയ സമ്പത്തുള്ള ഡോക്ടർ നിലവിൽ കേരള ആരോഗ്യശാസ്ത്ര സർവകലാശാലയുടെ ബോർഡ് ഓഫ് സ്റ്റഡീസ് അംഗവുമാണ് സമരിറ്റൻ കോളേജ് ഓഫ് നഴ്സിംഗ് പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ ഡോക്ടർ സിസ്റ്റർ ഷാലിനെ പുരസ്കാരം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിനായി ക്ഷണിക്കും അടുത്തതായി ഫാർമസി വിഭാഗത്തിന്റെ ബെസ്റ്റ് ടീച്ചർ സമ്മാനാർഹൻ ഡോക്ടർ ശരത്ചന്ദ്രൻ സാറിനെ ആദരപൂർവ്വം വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു കഴിഞ്ഞ പതിനേഴ് വർഷമായി അധ്യാപന ഗവേഷണ രംഗങ്ങളിൽ ശ്രദ്ധേയമായ സംഭാവനകൾ നൽകിയ വ്യക്തിയാണ് ഡോക്ടർ ശരത്ചന്ദ്രൻ ഇപ്പോൾ പയ്യാര മെഡിക്കൽ കോളേജിലെ ഫാർമസി വിഭാഗം അസിസ്റ്റന്റ് പ്രൊഫസറായി ജോലി നോക്കുന്നു അംഗീകാരമുള്ള ദേശീയ അന്തർദേശീയ ജേണലുകൾ ഇരുപത്തിയഞ്ചിൽ പരം ലേഖനങ്ങളുടെ ഉടമയാണ് അദ്ദേഹം കോളേജ് അലുമിനിയം അസോസിയേഷന്റെ പത്താം വാർഷികത്തിൽ മികച്ച അധ്യാപകനുള്ള അവാർഡും നേരത്തെ ലഭിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് പരിയാരം കോളേജ് ഓഫ് ഫാർമസ്യൂട്ടിക്കൽ സയൻസ് ഫാർമസി വിഭാഗം എച്ച് ഒ ഡി ഡോക്ടർ റോബിൻ ജോസിനെ കോളേജിനെ റെപ്രസെന്റ് ചെയ്ത് പുരസ്കാരം ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങുന്നതിനായി വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു Hearty congrats to all the award winners. Let's wind up the formal session by word of thanks. For the same, we may invite our registrar, Dr. A.K. Manoj Kumar. I am going to ask you 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 to ask you. most respected provost chancellor professor steve jensen and the statute officers jivanaka nath vishishtha dilaya award jeetakla adhyapakare mr dr oh oru karyam kodi maatha maatha samsarikkya ee eight teachers innale vare endayirunnu ennu aarum tirichirunnilla innu best teacher aayittu tirichi college ilekku povuvaa അപ്പൊ തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും നിങ്ങളുടെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികൾ നിങ്ങൾ ശ്രദ്ധിക്കും സഹപ്രവർത്തകർ ശ്രദ്ധിക്കും മറ്റെല്ലാവരും എന്താണ് ബെസ്റ്റ് ടീച്ചർ എന്തായിരുന്നു ഞങ്ങൾ അറിയാതെ പോയത് എന്നൊക്കെ ഉള്ള ഒരു നോട്ട് ഉണ്ടാകും അപ്പൊ നമ്മളിപ്പോഴും പറയാറുണ്ട് ആനയെ മേടിക്കാൻ എളുപ്പം മെയിൻറ്റെയിൻ ചെയ്യാൻ ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടാണെന്ന് പറയുന്ന പോലെ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി തരുന്ന ഈ ബെസ്റ്റ് ടീച്ചർ അവാർഡ് ഇന്നത്തേക്കല്ല ഈ വർഷത്തേക്കല്ല ലൈഫ് ടൈം ആണ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ലൈഫ് ടൈം അച്ചീവ്മെന്റ് അപ്പൊ ഇനിയുള്ള നാളുകളാണ് പ്രധാനം അപ്പൊ നമ്മളുടെ കുട്ടികളുടെ പ്രതീക്ഷയ്ക്കനുസരിച്ച് രോഗികളുടെ പ്രതീക്ഷയ്ക്കനുസരിച്ച് വലിയൊരു ഉത്തരവാദിത്വം നിങ്ങൾ ഏറ്റെടുത്തായിട്ട് മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്നു അത്തരത്തിലുള്ള പ്രവർത്തനം ഉണ്ടാകണം എല്ലാ നന്മകളും നേരുന്നു ആരോഗ്യ സർവകലാശാലയുടെ പേരിലുള്ള എല്ലാ വിജയാശംസകളും പ്രവർത്തിച്ച് നേരുന്നു അതുപോലെ ഈ പരിപാടിയിൽ കൊറേഷൻ നടത്തിയ ആരാധന വൈസൻ വലിയ സർ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ തുടക്കകാലൊക്കെ പല മീറ്റിങ്ങുകളിലും പ്രസിദ്ധീച്ച റിസർച്ച് കൗൺസിൽ ഒക്കെ സാർ വരികയും ഒരുപാട് ഉദ്ദേശങ്ങൾ തരികയും ചെയ്തിട്ടുണ്ട് സാറിനോട് പറയാനുള്ളത് അതെല്ലാം അതേപോലെ ഞങ്ങൾ നിലനിർത്തുന്നുണ്ട് ഇനിയും കൂടുതൽ ഉത്തരവാദിത്തങ്ങളോടുകൂടി മുന്നോട്ട് പോകുമെന്ന് ഉ
വന്നതിന് അങ്ങേയറ്റത്തെ നന്ദി കിടപ്പാടും യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ പേരിൽ അർപ്പിക്കുന്നു അതുപോലെ ഈ ചടങ്ങിൽ ഓൺലൈനായി പങ്കെടുക്കുന്ന നമ്മുടെ ഇക്ബാൽ സർ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി തുടങ്ങി അനുവദിരുന്നവരെയും എല്ലാ പിന്തുണയുമായിട്ട് നമ്മുടെ കൂടെയുള്ള സർ വിനായ മിഷൻ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി വൈസ് ചാൻസലർ സുധീർ സർ എന്ന് തുടങ്ങി നമ്മുടെ ജി സി മെമ്പേഴ്സ് എ സി മെമ്പേഴ്സ് ഒക്കെ സ്റ്റാഫ് സെനറ്റ് മെമ്പേഴ്സ് ഡീൻസ് കോളേജ് പ്രിൻസിപ്പൾസ് പ്രൊഫസേഴ്സ് സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് തുടങ്ങിയ എല്ലാവരെയും ഈ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റിയുടെ പേരിൽ ഉള്ള നന്ദിയും കടപാട് അറിയിക്കുന്നു ഒരുക്കിക്കൂടി എല്ലാവർക്കും നന്ദി അറിയിച്ചു നടത്തുന്നു for the invite